Welcome back to the First Team. I am Joe DeLeon, and joining me as always is my good friend and NFL draft analyst Ryan Roberts. Today on the First Team, we are going to be sharing our defensive tackle rankings for the 2024 NFL Draft. This is probably, Ryan, I think going to be the most diverse rankings that we're going to have, meaning that we're going to have very, very different ones. I've noticed that for most other position groups, we're pretty consistent. There's a couple differences, but I have a very strong feeling today that we're going to be nowhere near in the same ballpark except for who we have at number one. And I also don't know for sure if you have Jerjon Newton, the Illinois defensive tackle, at number one. What, what, Joe, why, why do you think this is such a di- uh, such a um, why do you think this is such a diverse? and different opinion of a interior defensive line class. Because of my, my opinion. I think it's Oh, just because of you? You're, you're, the, you're the person that's They're, causing all these issues? <laughs> yeah, because and I tweeted this. I said, my rankings today are going to be very toxic. And I'm just saying to you right now, I, I am confident there is no way that your rankings are, are close to mine. There's absolutely no way. And I can't <laughs> wait to tweet this because there are going to be so many people that are so annoyed with the, where I rank some of these guys, but I, I, I do you see where I'm coming from here? I, I, I get where you're coming from. It's going to be, it's, okay. I'm actually very interested to see because I actually don't know exactly what we have. That would be so much incredibly different, different, but I'm, I'm interested to find out, man, because this is a, it's a deep class. Right. And I think when you have, when you have a deep class with, like, I think Jerzon Newton's a headliner, right? Like a kid that can go yeah. top 15, top 20, and it would be very justified, right? But outside of that, I mean, there's a, several day two guys, which I think that the order can be meshed up a little bit. It could be a little bit of a difference of opinion. There's a lot of day three players that I think are just kind of yeah. in similar buckets. So I understand why there's a wide variety of opinions. There's also a couple of players that I think are just like so high for some people where I'm just like, all right, man, I'm not sure about that one guy, but... Otherwise, I think uh, it's, it's a it's a deep class, though, which is always fun to talk mm-hmm. about. Very deep. You hit the nail on the head, though, and why I think that is the, the very accurate reasoning for why I think it's going to be so different is because there's this really big clump of guys, specifically day two, that could go really anywhere. And I think it's going to be based yep. on uh, team needs. And then also there's just been like a couple of guys that were strong in their final year in college, but some of the things that they do in college don't really totally translate that well to the NFL. So we're going to get into it. I'm going to start us off here, Ryan. Okay. Mine, as we do, I'm going to give my 10 through six, and then we're going to go deep in our, our one through five. My number 10, Gabe Hall from Baylor. Number nine yep. to Vondre Sweat from Texas. Don't feel great about that, but I still stuck him in there. Number eight, Rook Aurora Roro from Clemson. Whoa. Number seven, Number Whoa. seven, Chris Jenkins uh, from Michigan. And then uh, number six, Byron Murphy from Texas. Why the Ruka Rororo hate, baby? I don't get that one. Why is that hate, though? I have a top 100 grade on him. Like, why is that hate? <laughs> I've said I'm a little bit higher, I guess. I, I guess I'm still buying yeah. into the traits a little bit more than you. I don't know. I, I, I get it. Trust me. Like, I get it. Still not refined. Still kind of more physical traits than proven commodity and he kind of he's like one of those guys joe that i think just tries to prove how much more explosive and stronger he is than every rep but doesn't always locate the football as well as he needs to does that make sense like he's just kind of a bull in the china shop type of style and i i think that he can be a little bit more of a finisher down the line that's exactly why i have him where i have him because i see all the traits and i've actually seen some discussion on Twitter saying that like, Oh, I don't really get this guy. And some people are really like pushing him. I think outside of top tens, uh, I see all the traits. I think that he could get there, but as you talked about, he's one of those guys that just gets super locked in on whoever's blocking him. And he just goes to battle with them, which is great, but I need to see a little bit more tangible production and disruption that is going to lead to plays. I just get really wary when I'm watching guys that, just don't find the football. I, I think that sure. sometimes that looks great on film, but I really would like to see it actuate into some actual tackles for loss, or at the very least, creating some problems for linebackers to come and clean stuff up. If you get too distracted with blockers, it can lead to open rushing lanes. It can lead to uh, chunk yardage picked up on, on rushing plays. So I, I just think he needs to do a better job of, of disengaging. Any other issues with that? 
Savantre Scott was what spot for you? It was nine, and I don't I don't feel great about that. He was actually did he make your top ten on my list? Oh yeah, he made my top ten. Actually, a little bit higher than you, believe it or not. Which is okay. Go ahead, yours. Let me let's hear yours. So number ten for me, a guy that has not been talked about much, but Makai Wingo out of LSU, who is a sawed off interior defense lineman. I think is pretty good, but you know we'll yeah. we'll talk about the size profile potentially. I have number nine is Leonard Taylor from Miami. Uh, sure you we'll ranked him? About him? Oh, I did. Wow. He's got Dude. great physical gifts, man. He's got great physical gifts, but yeah, his I, film sucked. I'm just gonna say it. His <laughs> I, his film was not good. He, I, right, I'm well, gonna come out. Save it till the end. Save okay. it. Save right, it till my end. Come on, man. You're go interrupting ahead. me. Come Sorry. On. Honestly, Sorry. You're, you're acting like me for a second. That's crazy. Sorry. All right, number eight. I have Mason Smith from LSU, the big interior defensive lineman. Tavondre Sweat, number seven. For me, out of Texas, and then number six, I have Dwayne Carter out of Duke. Okay, I'm curious to see what direction this goes in. Leonard Taylor for me is a top 200 grade. I think he is a very so day three grade. He is a very physically yep. gifted individual. Yep. But not only did he not produce, his film was just compl- like was a mess. I, I didn't see yep. anything that was indicative of a player who was going to stick around on an NFL roster. I I, I did not. I Why'd you give him a top 200 grade then? Top 200 grade would be a rosterable player. Well, I mean, stick like uh, as in a guy uh, that like, he's got, I'm just, he's draftable. I'm just balls, man. I know just he's draftable because yeah. his traits give him a high ceiling. If you get this player right. to lock in and play every single down, he could mm-hmm. be a really dominant starting defensive tackle, but Right. Miami didn't even deploy him as a full-time DT. Like he, he felt like he was really not on the field as much as he should have been. Um, and there's just like, guy, the guy just doesn't really have much intent on plays. You know, I get really yeah. worried with a guy like that. Bet online remains your top spot for all of your live betting action and contests. NFL, college football, UFC, NHL are all in full swing. Bet online is your number one source for wagering news, odds, trends, and predictions with both desktop and mobile access at any time. Head to Bet Online today and use promo code Believe. That's B L E A V for fifty percent off your first deposit. That is a fifty percent welcome bonus. Bet online where the game starts. Eight and nine are kind of like my clump of guys that are more traits than actual proven production or, and I kind of have question marks as far as like how much they want to be great, you know, to be very honest. That's why Leonard Taylor was number nine. And that's why Mason Smith's number eight too, Joe, because Mason Smith, I liked him. Looks, he looks like a first round pick on the hoof, right? Like you look at him, you're like six, six, three twenty or whatever the heck he is. Now he looks like Michael Brockers body type wise coming out of LSU, like just a really long but sleek frame where you're just like that dude could play a lot heavier if he felt like it right and he's got movement skills for days it's just just disappears man like he disappears like there's a couple nice snaps in a row and then you don't see him for like 10 to 12 snaps it's just maddeningly inconsistent which is why mason smith was down there with leonard taylor because both those guys are just all upside and no floor right and it's it's a little scary it's a little scary in that type of evaluation yeah, Mason Smith, I like considerably more than Leonard Taylor, just because I thought I saw a little bit more consistency from him. Uh, I I really like Mason Smith, though. I think that he could pan out to be a really strong defensive tackle if he shows a lot more consistency in his effort that he's giving on various plays. And I, I try not to to focus too much on effort, but defensive tackles need it. And my number five guy is all effort. Mm-hmm. Dwayne Carter from Duke, yeah. six foot three, three hundred and five pounds. I am in love with Dwayne Carter, man. I I think that he is a menace. He is so quick off the snap. He is so aggressive. I I really hyperfixate on these hyperfixate on these guys, these edge rushers, these these defensive tackles that look like they're getting into a fight every single time yeah. they jump off the snap. He is so, so aggressive, and I love that mentality. I think as a as a pass rusher, he's got pretty good upside because he just only relies on his bull rush, but 
that spin move that he has is so dangerous. And I wonder if he spends a little bit more time refining, adding a couple more moves and having a little bit more of a plan, if he could be a a productive interior rusher. But I I would take him anywhere on day two. I think that Dwayne Carter from Duke is a phenomenal, phenomenal football player. He might be the most powerful player on this list outside of McKinley Jackson. Wouldn't you say like, I mean, Dwayne Carter is like stupidly strong in a, in a tight window, which is funny though, Joe, because he's such a very solid athlete overall. Like I I don't think he's elite in any area, but like short areas, good straight line. Explosive is good. Everything's just kind of solid to good, but Duke, regardless, they put him at defensive end a ton, man. And like a four down look and they moved him all over the place. I mean, he was playing one at times. He was playing three. He was playing four, four. I, he was playing five at times for Duke this best. So they literally used him everywhere. And he came in at number six for me because, man, that kid is going to, whoever's in front of him, they're going to be in for a fist fight every yes. single snap, man. This kid is densely built, powerful, and his hands have some absolute violence in them. Like He's going to shock you at the point of attack. I actually think, Joe, though, honestly, if Dwayne Carter kind of took a step back and said, like, you know what? I'm going to work more finesse here and less power. I think he would be a more disruptive player at times because I just think he just tries to beat everybody up all the time. But he is I love that, though. (laughs) Yeah. He reminds me of. He reminds me a little bit. I don't know if I'll ever have the the pass rush upside that this player's had so far in the NFL the last couple years. But he reminds me of Deron Payne that plays with the the, uh, commanders now. Was that the Alabama? Same thing, dude. It's like powerfully built power was insane but when deron Payne was at alabama he kind of focused a little bit too much about just trying to be a bully at the point of attack and then the last couple years for the commanders i think especially the two years ago he had a double digit sack season where it was kind of like oh i can move too man like i can split some gaps occasionally as well so love to mention Dwayne carter he was number six on my list number five joe another third round grade because Dwayne ended up with a third round grade because i still do want to kind of see the, the finesse move into his game a little bit mm-hmm. i have byron murphy from texas with a third round grade okay who i i like parts of byron murphy and i dislike parts of byron murphy's game so here's the big sell to byron murphy and why he was number five on my list is that this kid is a gifted athlete man really sudden explosive dude who actually can bend pretty well as well man there's some reps where he gets on a guard's outside shoulder would kind of bend that outside track a little bit on an offensive guard and i'm like oh that's that's different right so and he had a pretty solid year in the sense of like eight and a half tackles for loss five sacks he had some production this year for texas but it's still inconsistent, right? Like it's still something where you want to look at him and say, like, I still mm. need a little, I still need more. Because one thing that's going to hold him back a little bit is that he's a sawed-off kid. I mean, he's only about six foot one. He's not going to have the greatest length in the world, and I think that affects him in the run game. Like I see him get kind of displaced a little bit too often in the run game, even though I think he has pretty good power. It's just a lack of length, I think, a lack of length, a lack of height. But if he is able to just kind of play a little bit more consistently at the point of attack and he keeps his athleticism that he has, that he brings to the table, this kid has about as much upside of any interior pass rusher in this class, and that's Byron Murphy. So I like the athletic gifts. I think the film is still very inconsistent, and I think there's some there's some things that are going to hold him back a little bit. But in today's world, in today's NFL, where interior pressure is at such a, a premium, it's something that people just want to have so often, this kid provides that upside in that regard. Yeah, it looks like you and I just kind of swapped Dwayne Carter and uh, Byron Murphy. Really liked him. Really low to the ground, which is problematic to deal with as we talk about, and we're going to talk about with Jurjon Newton. I love his athleticism as a pass rusher, and like the way that he closes down is phenomenal. He picks up speed very quickly. The length is the one thing that I just kept finding. My He might be sub 6'1 at the combine, which I'm really curious yeah, on. I, I need to know yeah. what his arm length is because that lack of length, it's going to show up in the run game like you talked about. So uh, there is going to be some carefulness that needs to be brought up with talking about a guy like that. My number four, this one's a little tricky, Ryan, because I, I don't know if you have him as an edge or not. And I know some people consider him to be an edge, but I see physical profile wise as a three, four defensive end or as a three tech. And I'm talking about Brandon Dorless, the Oregon okay. Defensive lineman, I guess, is what I classify him as. I, I just was, yeah. I was battling with myself. I'm like, where do I want to put him? I don't think that he, and he actually could probably play 
as a 4-3 defensive end. This is why, yes. though, I think he is so valuable as a prospect. Good flexibility, good versatility to play multiple roles in any scheme. Any team can draft this kid and figure out how to effectively deploy him. I thought that his hand usage as a pass rusher was very violent. I thought that he showed a lot of potential as a pass rusher and what he could be. The length and the flexibility is where I just really fell in love with him as a prospect because I see him as this interior guy who can um, extend and hold the point of attack and anchor really well, locate the football. I, I think that he brought everything to the table at six foot three, 290 pounds. He just feels like he yep. could be just a really good, versatile defensive lineman in the NFL. So I had him ranked as an edge because he's the kind of guy I've been wrestling okay. with the last couple of years because. I mean, at one point, Joe, he was listed at 280 something pounds, and he's kind of in that weird threshold of do you lose weight and stay on the edge, or do you gain weight and just kind of fully adopt playing inside on a more full time basis? And, and he always went the, the former there, right? Like he always kept dropping weight. I think he was, what, 270 something pounds at the Senior Bowl? So, like, he's a very light guy, obviously. Yeah, he was only like 270 something, I believe. I don't like that. Bowl. I don't like him. Well, doing I, that. I, I, <laughs> I, I think he, just, I think he just wants to stay on the edge. Like, I don't think he wants to play inside. Which I think that he has upside though in either regard because I, I posted a clip of him in 2022, which is actually his down year. He was actually a lot better 2023 than he was in 2022. But the kid's mm. twitched up, man. He's got some twitchiness. He's got some short area quickness. There's a lot to like with Brandon Dorless. I just think that you need to figure out where exactly he sees himself on the next level because he's kind of a – it reminds me a little bit of Rashawn Gary. And Rashawn Gary was a much better prospect than Brandon Dorless. But Rashawn Gary was the same thing where it was like, Rashawn, are you, are you going to add some more weight to play inside full-time? Are you going to stay lean and play on the edge? And he obviously opted to stay lean. And it's ended up playing pretty well for him, right? Like, he's been a very good player for Green Bay. So I think Brandon Dorless is going to be in that similar conversation of, you know, what is your – what is your? Where do you see yourself on the next level? Because I'm not sure I know 100% where I see him. Yeah, I know this is a defensive tackle show, but like I yep. think the best way to just describe him is defensive lineman. You know, that, that yes. just keep it really simple. And I, I don't think there's going to be people when I post my rankings, they're going to be like, why is Brandon Dewar this defensive tackle? I just think he is the one exception that you can't really go wrong with where you put him. You know, there there is yeah. one team is going to see him differently oh, oh than another. And right. Yeah. Uh, all right. You're number four. He might be also very valuable too because he could probably play a little bit of three man front, a little bit of four man at times too, which is going to help his value. Right. My number four, Michael Hall Jr., Ohio State, betting on traits here. Traits because 2022, I thought there was a lot of good. 2023, I thought there was less dynamic, 100%. A guy that I don't think has made as many plays as I would have liked him to make. But I went back and I watched some of this film. The Notre Dame game was one game especially where he doesn't have a gaudy box score, but I thought he played really well. And I thought he was really disruptive. This kid has length, 33 plus inch arms. He's explosive. He's a really clean mover. I think he might be the best all-around athlete of any defensive lineman on this, on this list for me. I really do. Michael Hall is a special mover on the interior so i'm betting in the traits a little bit full transparency there but i would draft this kid in the second round and just roll mm -hmm. with it just figure it out put him with a good defensive line coach and we will try to get through a few few of the bumps because i think that the athleticism and the upside is absolutely there to play in an even or odd man front because his length i think will allow him to do so uh michael hall jr is my number three defensive tackle so it's a nice transition nice. there Twi twitched up kid. I mean, this kid is an unbelievable interior rusher. And you talked about how his arm length completely removes any concern that we have for uh, him being a little bit too sawed off. I will say where I think there is a lot left to be desired and you understand why Ohio State didn't necessarily keep him on the field full time. Tyleek Williams kind of took a little bit more of a bigger role and was on the field far more frequently than, uh, than Michael Hall was in 2023. But when he came on the field, he was fantastic as a pass rusher. Guards could not keep up with him. I think he just needs to maybe add a little bit more uh, weight to his ass, a little yes. bit more lower body strength to take on double teams a little bit better. But, God, he could be one of those players that we see and we're talking about on a weekly basis that um, is just incredibly productive as a defensive tackle. Kind of like, um, is it Matt Abike was the, the defensive tackle with the Ravens this Justin year that had like, I feel like I'm not comparing the two, but I feel he could turn into that type of a player that has a ridiculous sack total for a defensive tackle just because he's so quick. Yep. 
He's so flexible and he's so explosive for an interior rusher. Yep, I agree though. He need definitely needs to add some weight and some mass to his frame. There's no doubt about that. Joe, wasn't it a shocker that Tyleek Williams went back to school? I thought Tyleek was really good. I know, this year, man, but he decided to go back. I don't he know been, why that he was, probably but... would have been number two and gotten like a late first, early second from me if he if he declared. He would have, yeah. He he had a, he had a path towards ET two or DT three in this class. I think he really did. But number three for me, a guy that it shouldn't be a surprise based upon our conversation previously, Rukororo from Clemson, who I just completely butchered his name, Rook Aurora Roro. <laughs> Who is all of six three plus two uh three hundred uh two hundred and ninety-five pounds right around, I think was his listing in the spring. He's got great length for the position as well. Another one, Joe. I think number four and number three for me are both betting on traits a little bit, but Rook has mm. some absolute traits, and he's still a younger player because he was a really young freshman three years ago. So he's a fourth year defensive tackle, but he's still pretty young. So I think that the development upside is still there. And this kid, I mean, honestly, even when he doesn't have great sack numbers or tackle for loss numbers and game disruptive numbers, he still impacts the game, man, because he is just such a difficult player to handle from a power and explosiveness perspective. So he's not the player that I need him to be today. But again, gambling on traits in the second round, I'll take the gamble all day on Ruko Oro. McKinley Jackson is my number two. I already shared my Same. thoughts on, on, on Ruko Oro Oro, so I, I don't want to just reiterate that, but... I'm actually surprised that we're both on the same page here with McKinley Jackson. Six foot two, 235 pounds, Ryan. Yes. Sir. One of the things that has always stood out for me with defensive tackles that I look for. I, I read a, a book that detailed and, and covered Ed Orgeron when he was at Old Miss and he was recruiting, and there was a, a, an excerpt that stood out to me. He is notorious for finding and developing some of the best defensive tackle prospects in college football. And the line that he mm -hmm. said that always stands out to me when I watch defensive tackles is how quick does a guy get off the ball? That is the most important thing to him when he's making evaluations. Because if you get off the ball quick, it means you've got explosiveness. It means you've got good awareness. It means you've got aggressiveness. And it usually pans out on the field. I think McKinley Jackson is the best get off of any of these guys. And he's 325 mm -hmm. pounds. He is one of those players that is a haul to move. But you see some really nice flexibility. You see some some pretty good explosiveness. That not only is their upside and impact as a space clogger and a guy who is just going to eat up double teams and take up space, but I think that he could turn into uh, an impactful pass rusher. Maybe not one who racks up double digit sacks, but who can move and, and supply some pressure and get in the face of quarterbacks that sets up other guys to be productive. This is somebody who you draft that is going to not show up in the stat sheet, but is going to help help the rest of your unit. I kind of get some like Dexter Lawrence vibes from the way that he plays. If that's a not a bad comp, I think that that fits pretty good in it terms a little of bit. physical profile. Three, three inches shorter, but yeah, three inches shorter, but I, I can I can see where you're going for there. It's not proper. Yeah. But I I, I get where you're going from. From a role. <laughs> he was Dexter right? Lawrence was a six five, really? He's like six four something, yeah. Dexter was tall, man. Dexter was tall as heck. What did what did um what did he uh what did McKinley Jackson come in at the combine? Was he six one? Six four, three six, forty was Dexter Lawrence. Six one and five eighths, I think, was uh McKinley. Uh -huh. So he's a little bit short. Yeah, it's not far off. Short. Two inches, two inches. We're, oh yeah, two, 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 two and three three eight three eighths, but yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. We're, we're being super uh, specific here. Uh no, but Joe, I mean, yeah, he's number two for me, McKinley Jackson, because of a couple of things that you hit on at worst. And I think this goes undervalued a little bit in, in the draft talk sometimes at worst, this dude's going to be a premier run defender on the next level because he is just low center of gravity, physical, strong, right? And explosive. Those things together, brother. Like he's going to reset the line of scrimmage a ton on the next level. Is he ever going to be a big sack artist? I have no idea. Probably not. Like that would be my, my thing would say probably not. Right. But I think he has enough juice and enough explosiveness to at least push the pocket to affect the passer occasionally. I don't need this guy to be a six, seven, eight year sack guy. Like I don't need him to be that because he is going to do the dirty work and leave le and allow me to be le allow me to play lesser boxes at times because he mm. is just such a good run defender. So yes, Number two, McKinley Jackson, which leads to number one. Can I lead us off here with number one? Yes, go. Time, right? 
Well, I, I, okay, is that not my role in the show? <laughs> what do you have? No, it's, like, it's, it's like Jersey me driving on. the car, and then you're like, let me let me hold the wheel for a little bit, and it's like, okay. <laughs> Jerzon Johnny Newton, Illinois, six mm-hmm. foot one and three eighths, I believe is what he measured in that before the season. Three hundred pounds, thirty two inch arms. He is an anomaly in terms of it's not how you draw it up as a defensive tackle. It's not how you draw it up. It's just not. But the kid has some rare flexibility for an interior rush. I've seen him bend the track as a pass rusher, which is just very uncommon for 300 pounds. I've seen him split gaps. I think he has pretty violent hands, and he is a finisher in the backfield, man. He has closing speed to burst. This kid is Jarrell Casey to me. He played with the Tennessee Titans, who was a dominant interior defensive lineman for a long time. Was he the best run defender of all time? No, because he's a little bit of an undersized guy. So he's a little bit of a limited impact there. But he's good enough. And when you combine that with the fact of his penetration ability and his ability to affect the passer, Jerzon Johnny Newton, I think, is the best bet in this defensive tackle class. And I think he's probably the easiest eval, despite him being a little bit of an odd body type and a little bit of an outlier from a size perspective. Yeah, the one thing that I always come back to as well, outside of that first step quickness, which he has, disruption are you causing problems not only are you holding the line of scrimmage but are you driving guys back he is one of those rare guys that is going to just play under double teams and not allow them to move him that is so valuable but on top of this this guy could very likely be a productive pass rusher like i i see a world where he becomes uh, a double digit sack interior defensive lineman he has all of that capability to be one of the premier defensive tackles in the NFL. Now, where he gets drafted might be different than what we're talking about here because defensive tackle value has shifted greatly over the past few years because it's just, you know, not as, um, you know, it, it's not as worth it to invest early with draft capital instead of spending that capital on other positions. But George on Newton, a surefire top defensive tackle one in this class. Folks, thank you for tuning in at Joe DeLeon at Rise and Draft. We'll be back with more. Make sure you hit that subscribe button so you don't miss out on our NFL Combine coverage or any of the rest of our coverage for the rest of the cycle. And leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you're tuning in.